Uh, so as mentioned, we're talking about documentation and sterilization today, which um, it's some of the most important things that are done in the practice. And yet so often it, it can be overlooked. I mean, we get busy, there are a million things going on, um, but so, so, so important. And literally there's no one better to talk to us about how to do this properly than our guest presenter, Tia Hunter. So um, I'm excited to introduce Tia to you today for those of you who don't know her. Um, Tia was named one of the top 25 women in dentistry by Dental Products Report Magazine. Um, she's a member of the American Dental Assistant Association, where she holds the honor of master. Um, Tia is a contributor to many dental publications, and she's also the director of the Dental Careers Institute and sits on the editorial board for OSAP, which I actually had to look that up. I'd never heard of it. So maybe for those of you who aren't familiar, it's the Organization for Safety, Sepsis, and Prevention, which is the only dental membership association for oral health care professionals that focus exclusively on dental infection and prevention and patient and provider safety. Um, so that's awesome. I didn't even know there was an organization dedicated to that. They're amazing. Check them out. So, so I'm glad that you're introducing us to that, um, especially I'm sure that's a great resource for what we're talking about today. Um, real quick, T is also the author of seven CE study courses. Um, she wrote a book on motivation called Rockstar Dental Assistant uh, and a dental compliance calendar, which we love. Um, it's the greatest. Tia, if you have a moment today, I would love for you to talk more about the calendar. It's amazing. At ADOM, when we were next to each other at the conference, it was such a hot item. Your booth was packed the entire time. So definitely touch on that. Um, but Tia is an international speaker and is, cert and is a certified trainer in nitrous oxide in several states. Um, so with that, Tia holds a certification in OSHA and HIPAA, and she's very qualified to be here presenting on our topic today. So thanks again, Tia. I will hand it over to you. Thank you, dear. Thank you. That was great. That was a great introduction. Thank you so much. Um, yes, OSAP, Organization for Safety, Asepsis, and Prevention. They are all things dental office infection control, and they are amazing. You can be a member as an office. You can be a member as an individual. Uh, and you get, there's webinars, there's uh, little info bites that, that they send you in, in email uh, publications. So check them out. If, if you're wanting to dive into infection control, it's where I learn um, almost everything. They're an amazing organization. But thank you for having me guys today. Thanks a lot for having me. We will be talking about that calendar, among other things. Both of these uh, topics here, I could probably talk for a couple of hours on. So I'm going to I'm going to talk really fast. No, I've got a lot of information in this hour to give you. At the end of the presentation, you'll have my email address. And of course, these lovely people know how to get a hold of me also. So if you have questions, um, if you think of something, you know, after the webinar, feel free to reach out and just uh, email me and I'll be happy to help you. The importance of documentation. Let's talk about that first. Man, this is this is so important that you know people people aren't doing this the right way. Um, Dr. Roy Shelburne will tell you uh, he will tell you how to stay out, stay out of jail, and this is the one thing that he teaches on. Uh, so you know we're we're just we're not doing it uh, completely. Uh, we're we're taking chart notes. And I think when we think about documentation, we think about patient chart notes. Well, that that's true, but there's a few more things than that. Lawyers say we're actually the easiest people to sue because our chart notes stink. They just stink. We're not giving enough information to everybody. And so therefore we're, we're going to get caught, but we'll talk about that. This is when you think about when you're writing a chart note um, on anything you're writing, it's, it's becoming evidence, right? It's evidence in a court of law uh, to the dental board. And the problem is you don't know it's evidence until maybe sometime later it gets called into question. So therefore, we, we got to do it the first time the right way. We can't go back months later and alter something or go, well, we should have put that. Well, you should have put it at the beginning. So we'll talk about some of those things. But I think when you look at all of your documentation as evidence in a court of law, you take it a little bit more seriously. You can't document enough. It's all in the details, guys. It truly, truly, truly is. And I, I just can't say that enough. Uh, 
we don't remember anything. I can walk out of this room, go into the next room and think, what, what was I, why did I come in here? Uh, <laughs> we're terrible. And I think the more we get put on our plate, the worse we are at that. Sometimes I think I have 18 tabs open in my head and I walk away from one thing and completely forget. So I think now more than ever, documentation and, and writing everything down, even if you don't think it's significant at the time, really does become something more significant later. So make sure that you're getting all the details down when you document. So let's talk about some examples. OSHA, there are things we have to document to be compliant in OSHA. There are lots of things. Your office should have an OSHA compliance book. You should be taking notes. You should be, um, you know, I have check offs off lifts myself with my clients that I go through there and, and I want them to do it every three months. So, you know, there are, there are things we need to document. Uh, spore test documentation is for one thing. Um, documenting every single load sterilizer load now, you, you know, to make sure that it's, it's uh, every Every single load is getting done correctly. Lots of documentation that we're overlooking in OSHA and infection control. And of course, we know that there's lots of documentation with HIPAA. And that's just recording everything, not only recording everything on the chart notes, but recording everything that happens after that so that we have it all done. With HIPAA, you should have your own HIPAA compliance book as well. And there's documentation and protocols that we need for HIPAA and OSHA that should be documented especially now when we have new team members coming in, man, we got a lot of training to do, right? We, we expect them to know a lot and we have a lot to do to train them. Don't overlook the details of these things and training them the proper OSHA and the proper HIPAA. Uh, and kind of go, well, we got to teach them how to pass instruments. We got to teach them how to answer the phone. Don't overlook these things too, because that becomes so very important. You need um, B vaccines for OSHA. You know, documentation becomes huge. There you are, infection control, lots of documentation for that. Didn't used to be 42 years ago when I got into this practice, uh, got into this profession. We didn't do that, but we have to do it now. So make sure that you're documenting the things you need to document. And uh, I'll, I have a checklist for both OSHA and HIPAA infection control. If you are interested, uh, all you have to do is email me and I will send it to you. Um, patient charts, another way to document. And I think that's what we think when we think of documentation, but that's not the only thing. Um, phone calls, phone calls, document, document, document. i am got the computer up and I'm typing as the person's talking. First of all, I'm terrible. So they're going to give me their name. And I'm going to forget it two sentences later. So I'm really good about, I'm going to write down that person's name. This is Mark or this is Cindy. And if you think that that's silly, it's not silly. Um, and document their questions so that you can come back to it. Document everything. Um, medications. Medications are important that we are documenting not only medications, but it goes along with health histories that we are doing this. Now, I'm a firm believer that every time someone walks through that door, they need to have an update of their health history. No kidding. Some people tell me they do it once a year. Some people tell me they do it once every three years. Full hockey, I say. This is the deal, guys. We are oral healthcare professionals. So we deal with not only the oral cavity, but but everything that can affect the body as well, it all comes from the oral cavity. We know that from diabetes. We know that from heart disease. So we can't overlook these things. People don't associate their oral health with their overall health. And so we need to convince them that they're all connected. There's no magic wall separating the two. We have to teach people, educate people that these two are connected. So when it comes to health histories, every time they walk in that door, they need to fill it out. Maybe they've gone to the emergency room. Maybe they've had a change in their medication, but they don't think we need to know that. Because they don't think, you know, that's their heart and their heart is down here. We're not working on their heart. We're working on their teeth. So they're like, well, why do you need to know that? Of course we need to know that. We need to know the medications we're on. We need to know if they've changed, uh, you know, uh, medications. A question I like to ask open-ended questions. When was the last time your doctor changed your medication? And sometimes they'll start going through it and then you'll be looking at their health history and what they're telling you is nothing what they're taking now, although they just chart. Yes, 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 yes. I'm still taking it. Another open-ended question I love to ask is, when was the last time you were in the hospital? Oh, well, you know, I had that, um, I had some heart palpitations and uh, yeah, 
So we need to know these things. So because people don't relate their oral health to their overall health, it's up to us to put the two together. So health histories, medication, so important and so important yeah. that we document every little thing. Tia, a quick question on yes. that. Is it, does it um, count as documentation and would it stand up in a court of law if you're verbally doing this? Like you didn't necessarily have them refill out a physical form or your online. That's a great form. question. That's a great question. Is that your question or somebody else's? That's a great question. That's mine because I so, used to work in a practice. And so yeah. I would. Well, the rule of thumb is if a patient doesn't date and sign it, it didn't happen. Okay. So we need, uh, in my particular office, we do health histories in the back. The assistant or hygienist does the health histories with the patient. And then they sign a signature pad, signing it, saying that they've done it. So if they, the patient doesn't date and sign, it didn't happen. So when you're doing updates, uh, if you're still paper, do a half a sheet and have them update it, date and sign. If you are, you know, on the computer like me, either have them sign it with the mouse. Sometimes you can do the signature pad with the mouse or you have a regular signature pad. But if they didn't date and sign, it really didn't happen. So if you want it really to stand up, make them date and sign it. Great wow. question. Injuries, accidents, and there it goes. There we go back to OSHA again. We've got to document that there was an injury, that there was an accident, what happened, and not just with employees, with patients as well, because something may happen, and we're going to want to come back on that. They're going to, you know, turn this into our insurance company or something, you know. So we have to make sure that we're documenting everything. Confrontations. Oh, we've never had any of those in a dental office. Well, when you start asking patients to um, update their health history every time they walk in the door, you're going to have some confrontations. It's not that bad. So don't worry about that. But we do, we have patients call and they're angry about their insurance not paying, or they're angry about, you know, the bill, or they're angry about, you know, whatever. Um, they've missed, no show their last three appointments and we won't make them another appointment. Um, whatever it may be, uh, there's a long list of of reasons why people can complain, but I want you to document the confrontation. Even if it was with a, a new patient that we've not even seen, make sure you're documenting that. And if you're creating a chart for them, document, document, document. We want to have these things in case something happens, we have a backup. Again, the problem is later on is when we realize, man, we should have wrote that down. Oh, I wish I could remember what happened. And, and we, we just can't. So you want to make sure that we're getting it all. Lab cases, document, document, document. We want to make sure that we're documenting um, lab yeah. cases when they go out, um, when they when they're due back in, um, shades, all of those things. Uh, a lab, a work order. I see a question. I'll get to it one second. A work order, a lab order, is a legal document, and so we have to keep those usually for a period of two years or seven years in the patient's chart, and we want to make sure that we are documenting everything on there. Lab techs say we don't give them enough information, so make sure you're doing it. I do see this. Um, for confrontations, are there any tips or special specific wording? We can use many um, prefer patients uh, give us pushback on the medical histories. They do give us pushback on the medical histories. However, I promise you, every time they walk into the door of their physician's office, they are doing it. So, you know, find a way. And I will tell you in, uh, I use, uh, we're an Eagle Soft practice. So they come into our practice uh, when the assistant or hygienist brings them back. We stand at the computer. We go over everything. I change anything that I need to change and then they sign it on the tablet. So basically, we are talking about it. It's a verbal conversation. And then they're signing the signature pad. So it's not really all that bad. I think if you shoved a paper at them every time they came in the door, yeah, they would be a little upset. I have some clients that have just a half a sheet um, and it's just really, you know, any updates to medications any, and they don't really mind balk too much at that. I get it. I get it. Um, but uh, they do it every time at their physician's office. They also pay at their physician's office before we bring them back. And uh, they don't, they don't at our office, uh, they would probably have a fit. Um, what about reviewing medical history for pediatric patients accompanied by their nanny or another non-guardian uh, family member? Um, would we have the nanny sign the changes in the child's history? Well, first of all, I hope you have a HIPAA uh, form for that, that you have permission to talk to that nanny or talk to a grandma or sibling or somebody else, aunt or uncle, make sure you have that. So then if you had that, 
if they uh, were the one who brought the child in and they were updating the health history, absolutely, because we had permission from the parents. Make sure you're getting that. Um, is that it? Is there was there something else? I thought I saw something else. Those were the only two questions so far. Okay, good. Um, maintenance. It's important to document maintenance, and there's no better place to document maintenance than the um, Compliance Karma calendar, which is my calendar that I had created. And it's uh, OSHA, it's HIPAA, it's infection control on different days. It tells you when to do different things. Um, it helps you uh, keep track of everything. You can, if you send a handpiece out for uh, repair, you can um, write down the serial number of that handpiece when you put it back into working order. Let's say February 9th, we put the handpiece back uh, on the shelf. We autoclaved it and it's ready to go. If that handpiece breaks in a month, and we have to send it back in for repair, guess what? We can look back and go, that's the same handpiece. It's under warranty. So you want to keep track of those things. The calendar itself is a living OSHA document, HIPAA document, and maintenance document. It's nothing you want to throw away at the end of the year. It's something you want to keep. Um, what about a teenager um, who drives himself to the dental appointment and you can't get a hold of the parent to review <laughs> medical history should you schedule that patient? The way we work it in our office is um, we have the parent come in if they're under 18 years old, but they're driving themselves. We have the parent um, come in and, and do it. And in the beginning, I'm going to tell you that it is a little difficult, but they have come in before work, uh, you know, or they've come in the night before, you know, but we, we say within 24 hours ahead of their appointment, they must come in and update that health history. Uh, and that's true if that 18 or that 17 year old is bringing a 14 year old, because sometimes that happens too. They bring a younger brother uh, or sister. So we, we want to make sure that that parent is accountable. We train our patients in what they do and what they don't do. And so it's all about training your patients how to do it. Did we get some pushback in the beginning? Absolutely, we did. Now that we've done it for several years, guess what? It's all good. We're good. And so we don't have any problem from that. So it's all about, again, training our patients to do what we need them to do. If you, um, have, secure, yeah. if you have secure email, can mm -hmm. a parent email or like fill out? They a absolutely can. And that's about having your forms available online. Yeah. And you can tell the patient, you know, um, you tell the parent that they'll need to fill this out and get it to you, uh, you know, 24 hours before. Absolutely, you can. That's the that's the advantage of, uh, you know, technology right. and some of these uh, companies that are they're doing these forms online. So absolutely, you can. And then document, you know, document that. So. Um, but back to the calendar, it's great for to, to put all of these things on. Plan Forward is a wonderful sponsor of the Compliance Karma calendar. And so uh, they've got snippets in there throughout the calendar, as do other sponsors. But um, it's just a great tool to help your front desk and to help your uh, back office stay compliant. Um, fun things. Do fun things, document fun things, document the fun, uh, fun things. And what I mean by that is um, we had a, we had a uh, orthodontist send uh, a sombrero and some salsa and some chips to the office. And his request was for us to take the sombrero and take a picture of a mutual patient. So well, one of our patients, it was his patient also. And so we did that. We made sure we had the HIPAA form signed, but we did that. And we had so much fun with this little boy. And But we documented it. And of course, we took a picture. So that has to be documented as well, that we took a picture and that, that we use that picture on social media uh, for social media marketing purposes when we had his mom sign that. So, but we documented that. You want to make sure that you're documenting those things as well so that you have all your bases covered. Let's talk about some do's and don'ts. And there's there's not a whole lot of things, but but we probably need to bring them up. Always do chart notes on the same day. I see a question. I'm going to answer this. When parents intentionally avoid requests despite best efforts, if record request update, form and document that not getting cooperation, does that count? Um, personally, if I had a parent who would not update their health history, if they kept avoiding me, I, I would not see the 
child until they did. Uh, I don't know why somebody would do that. Uh, they avoid payment, <laughs> but why they would avoid wanting us, uh, their child to wanting us to know their child's uh, health history. I have no idea. Um, and some of these children do take some he pretty heavy medications. And so uh, I think that that's important that we know these things. And I would have a talk with that parent personally, and I would probably not schedule that patient until they did it, especially if the form is available online. There's no reason why they couldn't uh, do that. And, uh, you know, I have no idea why they wouldn't, but yeah, um, they like to avoid payments. So sometimes they like to avoid coming in, but if they can send it in ahead of time, I think that that's good. Always do chart notes on the same day. Um, you want to make sure that we are, um, that we are not going back in and changing that chart note uh, for whatever reason. Um, it's always a red flag that if you go in the next day or you go at the end of the end of the week and you come back and you go, oh yeah, I meant to write this. Uh, it's fresh in our minds right away. And we wanna go in there and we want to do this immediately so that you know we're all good and we don't forget anything. Uh, in evidence in a court of law, dental board, whoever it is, if we go back in, on a different day to change something, then that is a true red flag. And don't think, oh, I can go in there and change the date and it looks like it's the same day. You think that until the uh, server gets called in uh, for a subpoena also, and your server can be subpoenaed and they can go back and look to see when you actually made those. There is a record of when you go back in and you change dates. Uh, you just can't see it, but it's there, trust me. I can attest to deleting never actually deletes it. And it's uh, never deleted. It's never deleted. you can't get to it, but it's in your computer. Yeah. Trust me. Right. I know that. Right. Um, always log in under your own name. Uh, if you're walking away from your computer, log out um, and then log in. Or if you sit down at a computer and someone else is logged in, log them out and log yourself in. This is important because that documentation is under your initials. So you want to be sure that you're, we know who is making that chart note. If you put it under somebody else's, if somebody puts something under your name, let's say, you can be held accountable for that. You can be held accountable for, you know, uh, things that happened or didn't happen during that time. So you're actually protecting yourself when you're going in and doing your due diligence and logging in under your own name. Um, use proper abbreviations. Don't come up with your own abbreviations, uh, you know, that you're using. Use proper abbreviations, uh, something that anybody outside of your office could read. Otherwise, that's a red flag. Doctors, please read and sign all chart notes after, if your assistant has done the chart notes or your hygienist, take just a few minutes and, and look over those chart notes. It's uh, before the end of the day, by the end of the day because that's the best time to go in and fix something. If, if they omitted something, or maybe you wanted to interject something that you a thought you had or, or something that you picked up, maybe the assistant was out of the room when the patient said something and you really feel like that needs to be in there. Doctors, you have to do your due diligence for your own sake to make sure that everything's in there. Don't use any slang. Don't use your inner office lingo. That's my next one. And your, your own verbiage and your own word. Uh, write everything out. Remember, this is, we want these, these are professional chart notes. And, and also remember that now with, you know, the advent of HIPAA and the patient portal that we're going to be having um, that hasn't really come into play yet with, with everybody, but it's coming, um, patients are going to be able to read those chart notes. So I want you you to find professional ways to maybe say patient's behavior was unacceptable or uh, something like that. Um, we used to have other names for that, but I don't want you to use that. I want you to make professional chart notes so that when patients get those or when uh, patients giving this to another doctor to look at, these are professional chart notes. That speaks volumes about you. Um, never go in the day after to write chart notes or change the note. Don't do it because again, if something were to happen and that would get called into question, then it looks like we intentionally are trying to cover something up, which we are not. Um, soap notes. A lot of people use soap notes. Um, some people don't. They use the park method. Some people just use the templates, the software templates that are in EagleSoft, they're in Dentrix, Open Dental. Um, whatever your preferred way to make notes are, um, is how we want to do it. 
doctors and lead assistants and office managers on here. Keep in mind, our new people don't know how to do that. So don't let your newbie make a chart note when they don't even know what goes in there. Number 13, MOD. That's not the extent of the chart note, right? But our new people don't know what they have to do. They've got a lot to learn. And let's make sure that our chart notes are A, getting done and B, getting done properly. So I wouldn't put this necessarily on them right away. Um, Leslie, hi. Um, if we need to document a conversation situation with a patient, what is the best way to document? We have open dental always been taught to actually not document in the chart but Open Dental has a communication log and we uh, usually put documentation in there. Is that acceptable? I believe that if you think the conversation has to be documented, it should be done in the patient chart. Um, I would, um, again, make sure that that was done professionally in the way you word things. But I um, that is something that could be called in by the dental board. We actually had a patient turn us into the board and the chart notes that that particular hygienist made were absolutely phenomenal. And what was the first thing that the board asked for? Copy of the chart notes. So if you don't have it in the chart notes and they ask for a copy of the chart notes, that might be a red flag to them as well. So, um, and then use those templates. Um, we have one more question. That just oh, one more question. Oh, okay. I didn't know if that went away. We have the schedule up in the lab, break room and pano computer. We have EagleSoft. Should we have a global login with no privileges for these areas? You can. Um, that would, um, I wouldn't do necessarily a global login because then anybody could go anywhere in there and do anything. And then you don't know who actually did it. So I wouldn't have a global login. When you mean you have it up, I'm assuming you have it up on the computer, not like a printed version because People still do that, that have computers. They print it out and they put it up there. Um, I would, um, you know, you can hit the EagleSoft, what is it, Control H, and it hides. You can have the HIPAA, whatever your thing, uh, software is, you can have the hip, hit the HIPAA button and uh, get rid of it so that people can't see names. So that's fine. Uh, you can do that rather than have a global login. Correct on the computer, yes, so we use a HIPAA mode. Yes, absolutely. I would use HIPAA mode all day long. Okay. All right. So details, because you can't remember everything and I'm probably the queen of forgetting. So let's go into infection control, half and half. That, that, went, that went great. That's so half perfect. And half. <laughs> infection control. Um, you guys, the most important thing we do every day and you know, documentation's right up there with that, probably neck and neck as far as that goes. But infection control, it is keeping not only ourselves safe, but it's keeping our patients safe, our team members safe, our families safe when we go home. Infection control is so important and it's something we shouldn't overlook. Problem is we get complacent. We get complacent with this. We think, oh my gosh, that's no big deal. You know, that's Mrs. Smith. You know, she's 89. She's in the nursing home. She's fine. Let me tell you where the biggest percentages of STDs are that nursing home that Mrs. Smith lives in. So don't think that, you know, this is no big deal. Don't think that we don't, you know, we don't have to worry about Mrs. Smith or the little, you know, Tyler boy. We don't have to worry about those people. Yes, you do. Everybody is a carrier or possibly a carrier of something. And we need to keep each other safe. Before COVID, 39 states adopted, took what the CDC said, and they wrote it into their Dental Practice Act. They made it a law. And now I believe it is every single state that has written those guidelines and recommendations into their Dental Practice Act. So the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, those are the people that have to approve everything we use in a dental office, every piece, every material, every piece of equipment, you name it, these people have to approve it. Guess what? They follow CDC guidelines. OSHA, we have learned more recently, now more than ever, that OSHA follows CDC guidelines. And of course we know they do. And these people, your local health department, your local health department that can go shut a restaurant down can come shut your dental office down. And they've done that. We've seen it in Pennsylvania. We've seen it in Ohio. It has happened. So um, they follow CDC guidelines. So in your dental board, your dental board, your state dental board follows CDC guidelines. So when all those people are following CDC guidelines, 
don't, don't think that, oh, it's just a guideline. It's just a recommendation. I don't have to do that. Yes, you do. When these people are doing it, you have to do it too. And that's one of the biggest myths. And I hear doctors say that all the time. Well, is that a guideline or, or is that a recommendation or can I, do I really have to do that? And the answer, yeah, you got to do it. Um, the CDC came out with this summary of infection prevention practices in dental settings. They've had just a, a couple of updates. I believe this is 2003. They've had a couple of uh, updates to that. Um, this is a great read and very, very, very relevant to today. So don't overlook this. Uh, patients who are patients. Well, first of all, I'm a patient in my own practice. My family is a patient in my practice. It's elderly people who have weakened immune systems. It's kids who have you know, immune systems that aren't quite there and it's immunocompromised patients. It's diabetics, it's people with heart disease, it's people, people with all kinds of things. Didn't I just name all of our patients? Practically, yeah. So this is why we do what we do because we're keeping everybody safe. Does anybody know what this means? There's no prize if you answer right, I'm sorry. Um, but <laughs> this means don't use me twice. So if something is single use, one-time use only, um, disposable, however they say it, um, it, you can't use it again. You'll also, on very small packaging, you won't see those words disposable, single use. Rather, you will find this symbol. And that means don't use me twice. One of the biggest things I find when I go into clients is that people are reusing things that they never should reuse. Um, they're not cleaning them properly. So make sure if you have something that's disposable uh, or single use, be sure to get rid of it. And this is where the FDA, those people that have to approve everything we use in a dental office, this is where they say, if a device does not have reprocessing instructions, regardless of the labeling, we are to assume that it is single use and throw it away. And I have found that a couple of times, didn't see a two with a line through it, didn't see single use, didn't see disposable, but I also didn't see anywhere on how to clean that thing. So we want to make sure we're, we're um, watching that. What does this mean? Well, that's the universal symbol for autoclave me. Now, unfortunately, it's not that big, so we can't see it, but you'll find this on equipment like dental hand pieces, and it's real little bitty, but you will see it. So when you see this symbol, it means you have to autoclave me after each use. You're going to find it on every single hand piece you own, promise. You're going to find it on every single slow speed and electric motor, I promise. And don't let anybody tell you, oh, those aren't autoclavable. If something has a symbol on there, it's absolutely autoclavable. The manufacturer put it on there because it is autoclavable. Uh, you're going to find this on hygiene hand pieces as well. Um, so when you see this, it means autoclave me. Yes, those motors. I had to fight with my own boss. He was like, really? I said, here it is. Um, commonly reused items. Uh, such as nitrous oxide nasal hoods. I find these are being reused all the time. <laughs> Throw them away, they're disposable. And HVE tips. I even had a couple of practices approach me about they couldn't quite get their um, saliva ejectors clean. How did I recommend them cleaning that? And I said, I don't, they're disposable. So let's talk about some CDC violations. Improper management and uh, bio, of disposal of biohazard waste materials. If you have a blood red cotton roll and you wring it out and stuff comes out of it, it is biohazard. If you take that same blood red cotton roll and wring it out and nothing comes out, it's self-contained in there. It's regular waste. So uh, don't be throwing things in the red bag that you don't need to because that big red bag gets filled up and it's very expensive to dump. Um, improper disposal of sharps implements. Sharps have to go close, closest possible point of use. That means the operatory. If you have a sharps container with sharps in it in your sterilization room, that is a huge fine because you were showing that you are transporting that dirty needle. Don't do that. Throw them away. And that's an OSHA thing. We have to throw it away in the operatory. Uh, lack of appropriate personal protective equipment. Well, by now, 
after COVID, I hope that we all have appropriate PPE. Remember, all shapes, all sizes for all people, not one size fits all. Lack of a written exposure control plan. You have to have that down. Where are you going to send somebody? You can't just know it in your head. You have to have it written down. Lack of a written protocol for instrument processing and sterilization. Yes, it has to be written. It's more important now more than ever because all the temps that we have in and we're trying to get people through, um, we need to have it written down. I have mine inside a cabinet, my sterilization. So anybody that temps, uh, we got a new person, they can see exactly how that's done. Lack of verification of office staff uh, vaccine, Hep B vaccines. You wouldn't believe the number of practices that I come across and they'll say, oh, I don't, I don't know if I have all those. Well, you better find them. You better get them. You're supposed to have them within 10 days of employment or send that um, new hire to get it done within 10 days. You can't wait until after maybe their, their um, grace period or their, you know, their uh, period, the 90 day period review period. You have to send them within 10 days. You also have to train them on OSHA and HIPAA within 10 days. And you better document that. Um, inability to verify sterilization of dental instruments. Um, that means they're not bagged, they're not wrapped, uh, their package is torn open and one taken out, or there's a explorer or scaler sticking out of one of them. Uh, dated pouches. We have to date those pouches. So we know when we put them in or when we took them out, but whichever one you want to. Allowing instruments to go through every single cycle in the autoclave. That is so important. We have to, I, and you know what? If it's been done wrong in dentistry in 42 years, I have already beat you to it. And I used to do that. It used to, you know, open up and I would take my hot pads and take it out and throw it on the counter. You can't do that. We have to wait for it to go through that dry cycle. Then we can't take anything out of the autoclave until it's dry. Oh. All my stuff is wet when we take it out of the autoclave. Well, it's not supposed to be. So if it's if, if it's wet when you take it out of the autoclave, you're doing it wrong. I promise you, and I can help you with that. Um, improper flushing of dental unit water lines. We're going to talk about that. Repeated use of single-use disposables. Don't do it. Cross-contamination in the operatory sterilization area and or dental lab. There's truly a triangle. We can wear our... Um, our PPE, operatory sterilization area, dental lab. Operatory sterilization area, dental lab. Notice I didn't say go up front and check a patient out. Notice I didn't say go in the kitchen and get a drink. When wearing your PPE, you have to keep it in the triangle. You don't wear everything all over the office and spread your germs. Um, improper operatory disinfection, we're going to talk about that. Failure to properly sterilize dental hand pieces, the biggest failure is not properly lubricating them. And if you don't have a lubrication station, you're doing it wrong. That lubrication station can, can do what a human can't. Um, and that is put the right amount of oil, express all the dirt and debris in a force that that hand piece does not give it. So if you don't have a lubrication station, look into getting one. A lot of times you can buy a certain number of hand pieces and get one for free, but you're going to go through less turbines, less problems if you have a lubrication station. Trust me, I've been there. Uh, improper in instrument debridement. Make sure you're cleaning those instruments off before you put them in the ultrasonic or that hydrum because that doesn't necessarily get everything off. Like a composite or like bond doesn't necessarily take everything off. Um, failure to sterilize, uh, to use sterile gloves while providing surgical services. If you have, if you're doing surgical services, like most of us do, you must have sterile gloves and use those on those, on that particular procedure. Don't you love these little cartoons I found? I love them. <laughs> um, failure to use, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> failure to separate sterile from non-sterile areas in the sterilization room. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Commingling of dental materials in the food and the refrigerator. If you have to move your sandwich to get the bond out, you're doing it wrong. You want to make sure that food is in one fridge, uh, dental materials are in the other. And people say, oh, well, the only thing we have in our refrigerator teeth wise is uh, bleach. And that's all self-contained and wrapped up. You can't do it. You need to have separate refrigerators for both of them. Failure to maintain updated SDS sheets. Now they're called SDS sheets. You must have those updated uh, and you have to keep those for a period of 30 years. Yes, 30 years you have wow. to keep those SDS sheets. I know. 
an annual review of your chemical inventory, you must do that. Uh, bacteria can be found in dental unit water lines. All this crazy bacteria is inside our dental unit water lines. It is, it's true. And I've got, uh, I have examples of where people actually got injured um, and sick because of it. Um, clean water doesn't always equal clean water lines. I think water line, um, uh, dental unit water line contamination is something we don't talk about enough. I've been talking about it for years. Uh, there's a couple other my road warrior friends that talk about dental unit water lines, but this is truly something that we are not doing, um, that we are kind of complacent on and we're not doing it. And maybe it's just a lack of knowledge that we we don't know what we're supposed to do. Um, but it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty scary what can happen. Safe drinking water was established by all these people and it's 500 colony forming units uh, per milliliter of bacteria or less. So when we talk about all of these germs that live inside our dental unit water lines, and there's multiples of them, we can safely consume 500 colony forming units per milliliter, uh, anything over that. And you would be shocked to find that many times in dental offices, that number reaches in the several thousands, as far as 90,000, 100,000. And there's even documentation that the germs living in our genital water lines are too numerous to count. Absolutely. And that is a scary thing. I want you to think of the bacteria that lives in our water lines like plaque. There's, you don't brush your teeth for one or two days, it builds up. You don't brush it for three or four days, it builds up even more. Um, that's what happens. These are bacteria. They form colonies. They are living organisms. They protect each other. They feed off each other. They colonize. They group together. They, they help each other survive. And when they get so big and so strong, they're pretty a force that's pretty powerful and can cause a lot of disease. Uh, you'll notice it says it's breaking off. It goes, it gets broken off into the uh, uh, into the water lines. These are our water lines. They're small, they're dark, they're wet. They're perfect for growing bacteria. Bacteria love water. And so another reason to autoclave those hand pieces because what, what did they have in them? They had water. And clean water going in doesn't mean clean water coming out because the bacteria lives in the lines that the water's passing through. These are actual pictures oh. of, of, yes, of stuff. I hope you had your breakfast. Um, of stuff that came out of uh, dental unit water lines. That middle one, that's roundworm that came out to say hi when she went to hook up the high-speed handpiece. Those other two on each side, that was blown out of a three-way syringe. Doctor tells you to go, go ahead and rinse and dry that off for me. And you you hit it with that air water and, and then you go to dry it and boom, that little nugget comes flying out of there, right? Now picture that that's on a family member. Now picture it's on everybody, anybody, right? I'm glad we wear masks because my mouth would drop open and I'd get my HVE in there as fast as I could. But honestly, these things are living in our water lines. And if you're not testing your, if you're not treating your water, shocking your water and testing your water, you have no idea what's going on in there. So learn how to provide safe water, learn how to treat, learn how to purge, learn how to shock um, and how often to shock and then use the best source water available. And again, at the end of this, you'll have my email. I'll be happy to send you a written protocol for that. Uh, operatory disinfection, so important, so important. We know that germs travel in that radius around the patient, uh, three to six feet, we know. And so we have to make sure that our operatories are cleaned in that three to six feet, that they are getting disinfected, that they are getting, um, uh, everything is being, you know, it's got a barrier on it or we're disinfecting it, we're wiping it down. Uh, and what are we wiping it down with? Look at the kill time on your disinfectant. Do you know what the kill time is on your disinfectant? Uh, make sure that you're uh, doing it right. And I wanna point out to you in both of these pictures, both of these dental assistants are wearing heavy utility gloves. Yeah, heavy utility gloves. They are mandatory. Um, it's one of the things I say you we don't negotiate on. We wear heavy utility gloves when we're handling the dirty instruments once the patient leaves, while processing instruments, and while cleaning our operatories. Disinfectant, sterilization, and sanitize. There is a difference. There's a huge difference. Sterilization is killing all forms of life. It's killing all the bacteria, all the spore. It's killing everything. Disinfecting is just that. Some things can be disinfected. Some disinfected. Some things can be sterilized. Anything that's meant to be sterilized should be sterilized and not just disinfected. For instance, REN instruments. 
people all the time will disinfect their wind instruments, throw them in cold sterile. First of all, you shouldn't even be using cold sterile, but they'll disinfect them and then they'll reuse them. No, they're supposed to be autoclave. And on that little ring, it says autoclavable right there. So if something is meant to be put in the autoclave, put it in the autoclave. Don't just disinfect it. Put them in bags and leave them in bags until you need them again. Everything must remain, must go in in a bag and it must remain there. Cross-contamination is huge. Just like I said, don't go up to the front desk, lean on the front desk with our PPE on because that is not going to be good. Uh, we're gonna get germs all over that thing. You know where typically the most blood's found in the dental uh, office? On the floor. Mm. At the front desk. <gasps> no. Um, because we don't disinfect in there. We have people come up there all the time. They walk up there with their PPE on to get things. They lean on the counter. They do all kinds of things. And that's an area that doesn't get disinfected. It's pretty, pretty bad when you think about it. Um, sterilization areas. Now I wished everybody had a sterilization area that looked like this, because this is wonderful. We have an ultrasonic and, and we have a, that is an in, instrument, um, uh, lubrication station. Um, we have a statum, we have an autoclave. There's a flow to this room. We come in on that far left and that's the dirty side. And then we go all the way up to the autoclave and the statum. That's, that's the clean side. So everywhere from where we come in to where that autoclave is, the dirty side from the autoclave on the, the rest of it is the clean side. So nothing dirty can go on the clean side, nothing clean better get put on the dirty side. I know that some of us are challenged with very small spaces. I've seen them. I've been in them. I've had clients that are that are challenged with space, but it's it's important that we find space and that we um, uh, that we honor that and that we are making a commitment to to use the flow and not go back. Well, it's just it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. We're too busy for that. Um, this is my sterilization technique. This is how he looks. He's got on those heavy utility gloves because he has to, because he's processing instruments the whole time. Yes, he's bagging his instruments in his heavy utility gloves. And you know what? All it took was a little bit of practice. I tell people that come in with their denture in their pocket. They're like, I can't wear these. I can't wear these. They don't fit. I can't eat. And I tell them, you're never going to learn to wear them if they're always in your shirt pocket. And you're never going to wear, uh, learn how to wear heavy utility gloves if they're not on your hands. And you know, the biggest thing we do wrong is we're small, we put on a medium glove or we're a medium, we put on a large glove. It's not a one size fits all. Find the glove that fits you. If that's a small, that's a small. Sometimes they're kind of big. So maybe you need to get them. If you're a large, maybe a medium would work better for you, but they're puncture resistant and that's important. They're puncture resistant. So we have to use those. Here's that autoclave. Nothing can go in that's not wrapped. Everything has to be packaged in some kind of package and wrap. We can't stuff it full. Hey, I've done both of these things. Back in the day, I did both of these things. Um, load them up. We got to load that autoclave up. No, everything needs to be single file. Everything needs to be um, to make sure that we are loading it properly so that the steam can, can penetrate everything and everything can get sterilized. If we have it loaded too full, it's not going to. If we have it like this and just everything thrown in there, then absolutely it's going to be okay. But then as soon as it comes out of the autoclave, it's not going to be sterile anymore. So we can't have that. Um, this is a, a practice. Uh, they set the room up. Now, I used to set the room up and I would open everything up and have it all ready for the patient. Uh, but we can't open anything until the patient is in the room. And the only thing, um, and that does a couple of things. Number one, it keeps everything sterile until it's used. Number two, it's patient peace of mind. It is patient peace of mind so that, um, you know, people are aware, people are very aware, especially since COVID. And so I want them to come in and I want them to see that wrapped up so that they know that I'm, I'm unwrapping it and that it's clean. If we don't do that, um, they might have questions and I don't want them to do that. Um, I want you to notice that back cabinet in back of that. Um, that is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, you know, maybe some of those things we need uh, out, but I think we need to put that stuff away. We are supposed to wipe all that stuff down. If it's within that range, we have to wipe it all down, right? And we don't wipe down that stuff. 
and it's clutter, it's clutter guys. And when a patient comes in, I don't want them to look at that and think dirty and cluttered, cluttered, cluttered areas look dirty. And I don't want them to think that. So I want to put things away so that, you know, pa patient don't have, doesn't have that question mark. Guys, patients leave our practice all the time. The only place people feel confrontational is on social media. People aren't confrontational. And so <laughs> They, they aren't and they'll they might leave our practice and not tell us maybe they'll go make a review maybe they will tell their friends on their facebook page you know hey don't go to dr so-and-so's office because their office was dirty to to our patients who don't know what this stuff is it looks dirty so i when i walk into a client's office i want the 12 o'clock cabinet to be nice and clean and clutter free those business cards don't have to be out those business, that business card gets sprayed and splattered with everybody's blood and germs and gunk on every single one. And then we're going to go hand it to a person. I hand it to you, but it's got the last 30 patients gunk on it, right? Think about a Kleenex that's left out. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh my gosh, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, and that's my email address for anybody that wants it. Uh, but do we have any questions? I haven't been, haven't been looking. I've been watching. We haven't had any, but um, this is a great time. If you guys do have any burning questions, please um, let us know. Let us know now. Use the time. So much information on both subjects. I probably could have talked for two hours on each, but um, you know, I'm happy to follow up with anybody. If you uh, want to email me, I'm happy to follow up with you and uh, talk about that. I'm happy to talk about the calendar, my calendar, and you can find that at um, dentalcareersinstitute.net. Again, Plan Forward is a gracious sponsor of ours, and they have some little snippets in there that you'll find helpful. Um, dentalcareersinstitute.net. Uh, dot net is where you will find that the uh, compliance karma calendar it comes with some great stuff it comes with a six page uh, osha and hipaa checklist it comes with um you on the back of the calendar is every documentation that every dental office needs bar none that you have to have so uh dental careers institute dot net not dot com but dot net and we have a question yo there no there it is megan typed it in for us dental careers institute dot net there you go. And you'll see the little karma guy uh, pop up there. Um, it's Your a great calendar is, I mean, it blew me away, truly. And there's stuff for front office and back office. I mean, the front office, you know, this daily task of the uh, front office team, it's daily task of the dental assistants um, and hygienists, whether there's great hygiene information in there, tips and, and tidbits. There's all kinds of, we have all kinds of wonderful sponsors and there's all kinds of amazing things in there. So um, you'll want to check that out. You guys have got some good things coming on. Um, you've got some learning opportunities coming uh, uh, here in February with some, we some great stuff. We do. We're excited um, about all of the people that are gracious with their time and helping us with this webinar series. Um, these are the upcoming events and keep an eye out for the follow-up email from this webinar with the recording. And then these other events will be in there as well. Um, Tia, I, if, if, as long as it's okay with you, we can include your contact information in the follow-up email. Oh, absolutely. In, yes. In the dentalcareers.net in case they want to just click on it and go check out the calendar. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can include that as well. So that's absolutely dear. Problem. Absolutely. Okay. Fabulous. Well, um, as long as there's no other questions and you're all good, I think that's, I think that's a wrap. We'll give people four minutes back in their lunch hour. <laughs> exactly. Go enjoy. <laughs> Have a peaceful four minutes. And Tia, thank you so much. It was a pleasure uh, and such useful information. Great. Oh. Thank you, guys. Thank you. If you And again, my email, if you have a question or you would like uh, one of the documents I talked about, don't hesitate to email me. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks thank to you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.